This morning, our text is Genesis chapter 4. Our focus is the first man who was ever born on this planet. His name was Cain, and his tragic choices led him out of the shadow of paradise, away from the place of God's presence and sacrifice, and into an eternity of restlessness. I want you to imagine again what it was like for Cain. He grew up in a world that was fresh from the hands of God. He grew up with parents who never stopped talking about the wonders that they had seen, what they had heard as they walked every day with God himself. And like we saw last time, imagine the memories that were deeply etched on his heart as he went regularly to that place of blood and ashes where for 130 years his family had sacrificed sacrifices to God there by the gate of the Garden of Eden. All of this was Cain's legacy. Cain was the son of Adam. Cain was the son of Adam, the son of God, as the genealogy says in the very last verse of Luke 3. I was sharing this with my children. They said, wait a minute, I thought God only had one son. I said, Cain was the son of Adam, the son of God who was created by God. Jesus was the only begotten of the Father, never created. Jesus is God himself in human flesh, but Adam was created by God and was his son as God created him and was a father to him. And so it's a very unique thing to be the son of the son of God, as Luke 3 says that Adam was the very son of God. But Cain rebelled against God's way of salvation, as we'll see here in chapter 4. He neglected to appropriate the fact that God's clothing of Adam and Eve with the skin of slain animals had made it clear that the only way of forgiveness of our sins before God is through shedding of blood. And thus, the way of faith was the only acceptable way, not the way of human works. Cain rejected this divinely authorized way. And Cain, in our text, came to the altar with the fruits he produced with his own hands. God rejected Cain's offering because God rejected Cain himself. Cain's heart was not right before God. It is only by faith Abel's sacrifice was offered, and it is only by faith that Abel was accepted by God. The way of Cain, which is how the Bible describes Cain's life, is the way of religion without faith. It's the way of righteousness based on character and good works instead of on Christ's blood. The way of Cain is the way of pride. It's the way of a man establishing his own righteousness his own way and rejecting the righteousness of God that only can come through Christ. Cain became a fugitive. Cain tried to overcome the wretchedness of his sinfulness by building a city. Cain developed civilization and ended up with everything a man could desire in the world, everything except God. To see all this, let's turn to Genesis 4 now. And I'll be reading... The divine record of the lost world written from the mouth of God by the hand of Moses as we read Genesis chapter 4, verses 5 onward. You follow along in your Bible, starting in verse 5. But he did not, this is speaking of God, respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. 
Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Let's bow together. What sobering words to think of Cain going out from your presence, which literally means, O oh God, that day that he turned his back on your outstretched arms. You stood at the place of sacrifice. You, you underscored the importance of the only way to your presence through a substitutionary bloody sacrifice. And Cain said, no, I'll do it my way, not yours. Father in heaven, my heart is drawn toward some Cains who may be here today. Cain knew everything there was to know about you. He just didn't want to obey it. Cain outwardly conformed, but inwardly he never was transformed. Cain went through the rituals, but he never had the, the internal transformation. Father in heaven, there are some Cains here in every group of this size. In our Lord Jesus Christ, in your group of 12, one was a traitor. We could think of no better results in our day and age than that. I pray that your spirit would convict, that you would draw to yourself, that some would see the horror of their lostness as they are close to turning their back on you. Your arms are outstretched, Lord Jesus, on the cross. Your arms were opened as wide as they could be, saying to all who would come to you, come, come. But they would not come that they might have life. I pray, dear Father, that those who have ears to hear would hear and would be smitten with the horror of lostness and turn in faith to the Savior. And for us who know you, may we clearly see soberly the way of Cain and with all of our hearts turn away from any resemblance to that outward profession without possession. Bless the preaching and bless the hearing of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to remind you about Cain. Cain's dad was a son directly from the hand of God. Cain had no gaps in his knowledge of God. All the truth relayed to him was firsthand. And yet he chose to not apply it to his life. He failed to appropriate the truth. He failed to obey God. And so now Cain today suffers a fate that is worse than anything we could even Imagine, Cain eternally is consigned to wander apart from the God who sought him, who spoke to him, who even lavished his grace upon him. Cain, the scriptures tell us, is forever lost. The scriptures tell us that Cain is damned forever. You say, oh, it doesn't look that bad here. He just kind of went off and started a city. Well, let's look at the conclusion. Go back to the end of your Bibles. Hit the very last book, Revelation, and back up one to the book of Jude. And I'm going to read to you what the little postcard at the end of the New Testament, a little letter called Jude, says. And Jude was the earthly brother of Jesus, one of his four brothers. He writes a powerful letter on how dangerous apostasy is. Now, Cain is the first apostate. Apostasy is the willful falling away, turning away from known truth. It is the willful turning the back on a truth that has been very much embraced and looked upon clearly. In verse 11 of the book of Jude, it says this, Woe to them. It's talking about these, these apostates, starting in verse 5 down through verse 10. Woe to them have gone the way of Cain. See, he becomes the prototype. He come, becomes the father of all of those who turn their back on God. They have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit. We find him in the book of Numbers, a prophet for hire. And then they perished in the rebellion of Korah, one of the other characters in Numbers. Now look at the description of these people, the Cains of this world. They are filthy stains. That's what spots means. Filthy stains in your love feasts. That means that they're in church. Love feast is a euphemism for the celebration of the Lord's table. So these people were... were accepted, received, and perceived to be Christians. And they're at the love feast. But they were, in God's sight, as he looked down in the, the, the early New Testament church and all the, the beauty of their love for Christ, 
These individuals look like filthy stains. In, in vernacular in our home, uh, dirty diapers, you know, they look like that. When they feast with you without fear, that means they just partook of the elements and they acted like they were Christians and they didn't even fear God. Serving only themselves. This is, means they're selfish. Not only no purity, they didn't really serve God. They just appeared to serve God. They are clouds without water. That means they probably went out on visitation, but they never could give out the water of life. They, they were waterless clouds, empty. That means they were not personally satisfied by Christ. Carried about by winds. Late Autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. No life. No life. The, these, these canes, they look, they look like they have life, but they're dead. Verse 13, raging waves of the sea. What did James say? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He's like a, a wave of the sea driven with the wind. These, these have no moorings. They have no anchors. They have no boundaries foaming up their own shame. If you ever lived on the ocean, you know every time there's a big storm. I mean, our, our home on the water we used to live in, just every time there's a big storm, there'd be just all the trash of the, of the Atlantic just thrown up there, just bits and pieces and brown scum. Foaming up their own shame, that's the no boundaries in their life, just endless evil. And then look at this, wandering stars. It's interesting. The word wandering is the Greek word planetes, planeo. And that's where the word planet comes from in English. Because the ancients used to look up and they'd see some stars that stayed in the same spot. And there are other stars that wandered. And they didn't know any boundary. They just wandered all over the place. And they called them planetes, the planets. And now we know what the planets are. But he's talking about they don't have any foundation, no anchor. Uh, they're not built on Christ. And it says, look at the end of verse 13. This is Cain's destiny. For whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. It's interesting, they found this week a black hole, the closest one to our uh, solar system. And they said it's just, it's just amazing. It's right there. It's emitting x-rays and sucking in stuff. And it says that it's absolutely black. It, there's no light allowed. At the core of our sun, it's so dense. There's no light, yet it's total hot liquid fire. In fact, look at the end of verse 7 of Jude. It says that they suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. Well, back to Genesis 4. Let's meet restless Cain and how he got this horrible conclusion to his life. What we're going to see from the fourth chapter as we studied over these weeks is that the first five verses talk about the worship that God expects. And there's a type of worship that God expects from us. Uh, we learned last time that there is a place that God told Cain and Abel to come. Because it says that uh, in the process of time, verse 3, they came uh, and brought their offerings. That means they brought them somewhere. So God had revealed to them there was a place that they were to go. Secondly, God revealed a day. Verse 3 also says, in the process of time, which means in the end of days, which was the Sabbath day, the last day of the week, the seventh day. So God says, I want you to, to come to me in a specific place. I want you to come in a specific day. And then the writer of Hebrews tells us that by faith, Abel offered his offering. So that means not only was there a place to go and a day to go there, but there was a way that God wanted his offering brought. And if you know anything about faith, faith is not, you know, I believe somewhere uh, for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. That's not faith. That's foolishness. Faith is based on revealed truth. You believe a revealed truth. And, and the faith that Abel had was God says, I want a living animal that gives its life for your sins. And that's what I want on the altar. And that's all I'll take a substitutionary bloody sacrifice in your place. So Abel says, that's what God wants. That's what I'll give him. That's what faith is. God said it, I'll obey it. That's faith. Faith responds that way. And that's the worship that God expects. Verses 6 and 7 of chapter 4 is the second part, which we're doing this morning. The warning God gives. God says to Cain, Verse 7, if you do well, you'll, won't you be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin is going to get you. It's going to master you. It's going to get you. Well, God is very specific about worship, and the problem is that doing all the right things is not enough if they don't come from a heart of love for God who ordered them. Unless our obedience is prompted by faith, that's responding to the revealed truth, 
The work that we do in our life is worthless. Now, just for a minute, think about Cain in a different way than you've ever thought about him. We always think about him as a bad guy. Cain would fit right in here this morning. Cain worshipped and believed in the one living and true God. He wasn't bowing to Buddha. He wasn't believing in, in some Mormon, you know, angel God brother of Satan thing. He came to the true God. He believed in him. He believed he was the true God. He believed he was alive and the only God. He didn't think there were any other gods. He knew there was one living and true God. He came to that God. He didn't neglect coming to God. He came right to him. He brought him offerings. He brought offerings to God. I mean, if, if we didn't know the revelation of God, we would have thought he was just wonderful. I mean, he brought the very best. He didn't eat it. He gave it. He also worshipped the one living and true God. He came with his folks. Then they never say that Cain didn't come to worship God. He came. He approached. He worshipped. He gave. The problem is he did it his own way instead of God's way. Specifically, Cain was not accepted because God had revealed that there was only one way to him. And Cain and everyone who follows the way of Cain since always neglect God's way. Number one, the first error of Cain was he didn't shed any blood. Look, look again at our text where it says... Cain brought, verse 3, of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. He brought apples and pears and plums, juicy, whatever, squash, doesn't matter. What he, he brought something that he grew. But Abel brought of the firstborn and of their fat. That means he had to cut them up, kill them, and their blood was shed. No blood was shed. And God said, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Secondly, Cain did not offer a substitute. The offering of a substitute in his place. God says that you are to bring a life for your life. You are to say, I can't save myself, so this, this animal has to give its life for me to temporarily cover my offense against you until all of those temporary debts that are covered temporarily are all placed onto Jesus Christ. That's the substitutionary atonement of Christ idea. Well... Look at the end of of, uh, verse 4. Abel brought fat portions from the firstborn of his flock, but the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. You know, they both came and set their offerings on the altar, and there it sat, Cain's freshest, unblemished, plump, juicy, vibrant produce. Like a prize-winning hybrid, it stood out on the old fire-blackened stone altar just outside the walls of Eden. There it sat on the spot where Adam and Eve had been coming with their boys for 129 years since they were thrown out of Eden. There to the place God had picked to set up as a meeting place of sacrifice. There to the spot where God said blood of substitutionary sacrificial lambs had to be shed. There to the spot where those overwhelming beasts shadowed the place, those beasts called the cherubim that we met last time, with their all-seeing eyes and ever four-square faces representing God's presence. There in that spot stood Cain, tall and proud of what he had brought and of what he had done and what he had given to please God. Every time I read this, I think of many years back, and I don't know when it was, I don't know if it was Grammys or Oscars or whatever, but Frank Sinatra was all in a black suit and his black tie, and they turned the lights down and the spotlight got on him and he received some big award. I don't remember what it was because, because I don't even remember why I was watching it, but I do remember the song. He got the award and he was standing there holding whatever it was, and they brought out the mic to him and he said, He sang, I did it my way. I've never forgotten. That's the only Frank Sinatra song I know in the whole world. And it's the song of Cain. I go to God my way, not your way. It's the song of our world. It's a song of religion. It's a song of of liberal Christianity. We are not going to go God's way. We're going to go our way. Well, God was not pleased No fire fell. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, it says the Lord respected Abel and his offering. How do you think Abel knew God respected his offering? Well, what happened every time 
An offering was put before God at a climactic moment when it was a moment for God to show whether he liked it or not. What happened when Elijah placed his offering on the altar? What happened when Manoah placed their offering on the altar? What happened when Solomon put his offering on the altar? What happened when when the tabernacle was set up in the wilderness and Moses put his offering on the altar? What happened every time that God was asked whether he approved of it? Fire came down from heaven. It's very likely in the setting of the, the Old Testament scriptures that This altar where they placed their lambs, fire came down from God and consumed and said, I accept your offering, and it licked it up. No fire fell. No voice of God testifying to the excellence of the sacrifice. There was nothing but the overwhelming silence of those living creatures of God's holy presence as they floated there around the altar and looked down at that fruit, and God did not accept it. Well, look at verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Because right there and then it happened. The charade was up. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Cain became enraged. As it says in verse 5, his countenance fell. Someone, uh, most of us have experienced this, someone who pretends patience with us or interest in us, and then finally say, that's it, that's enough. You know, and they show their true colors. That's what happened with Cain. The real Cain came out. He was enraged and angry at God. Because when God would not accept his self-styled worship, he exploded. As Paul said of the Cains of this world, they have a form of godliness, but they've denied the power. They just go through the motions. They have profession without possession. Because Cain's offering was without obedience, it wasn't real worship. Cain offered in the right place. He offered on the right day. He came to the right God. He even stood at the right altar. But God says that's not enough if you don't come my way. And that's one of the fundamental problems that's dividing Christianity today. God says it's by one sacrifice forever, the substitutionary work of Jesus Christ alone. He said, if you don't come my way, it's self-styled worship. However Christianized, however biblically sounding, it's not real worship, and it wasn't accepted by God. Well, look at verse 7, continuing through the text. If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? If you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, and it desires to have you. The question is, why did God make such an issue of this? Well, God was warning Cain. He was warning him of a danger so horrible, so deadly, so horribly dangerous that he could relate it only to an unsuspecting, crouching, and attacking predator. That's what the words here, when it says... Sin is crouching or lying at the door. It spoke of a monster. It spoke of a, of a terrible, horrific, predatory monster that was ready to, to consume Cain. And he didn't even know it was there. And that predator, that, that monster, was his sin. God says, either you let your sin be put onto Christ, the substitutionary atonement, or your sin will master you and it will eat you. Only... If sin is dealt with by expiation, by a substitutionary penalty-removing offering of blood, could it be disarmed? Only when personal sin is removed and the consequences are put on the coming Lamb, Jesus, is a person safe. But Cain rejected God's way that day at the altar. And that rejection was actually a refusal to allow his sin to be placed on Jesus. And when people come to God with their self-styled worship, with their good works, with their righteousness, their filthy rags, when they offer that to him, they're saying, my sins, I do not want to put on Christ. I'm going to take care of them myself. And that means their sins will consume them. Cain and Abel are not only two actual people who lived and walked on earth a few thousand years ago. They also represent the two roads that head out from the Garden of Eden. Everyone who has ever lived has chosen one of those two paths, and each of us this morning are on one path or the other. There are only two families, God's family and Satan's family. There are only two destinies, heaven and hell, two choices to repent or to reject. There's only two lines, the line of the woman's seed, which is Christ, and that of the serpent, which is Cain. The line of Christ began with Abel and passes by the hill called Golgotha, and it leads to heaven. The line of the Antichrist began with Cain, and it goes to the Tower of Babel, and it leads to the Lake of Fire. Each of us belongs to one family or the other, 
And by the path we choose, we choose our destiny. Watch the choices that were made by Cain and Abel. Because both were born outside of Eden. Both were sinners and fallen. Both were lost in guilt of sin that they had committed. Neither were innocent. But only Abel was willing to confess to God that he was a sinner and nothing in his hands could he bring to please God, but simply to a substitutionary sacrifice would he cling. When God declares in the text, in verse 10, that your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground, he was saying, sin that is undealt with cannot be hidden. God says, if your sin is not underneath the blood, neath the cross of Calvary, removed as far as darkness is from light, then it's going to forever cry out for my vengeance. And that's what hell is. Some people say hell is absence from the presence of God. You can never be absent from the presence of God because God will always be omnipresent. But it means absent from the gracious mercy of a loving God who withholds his wrath because of the sacrifice of Christ. Sinners die in their sin and they're forever the endless targets of God's wrath, which will ever be against sin. And so you choose today to either die with your sin all caked upon you and have the burning wrath of God forever directed against you or to come to the cross full of mercy and grace and come to the cross where Christ died in your place and say, my sin, I place on him, my substitute. Well, what do we see in Cain? Look at him in verse 9. The Lord confronts him and says, where's your brother Abel? The Lord has his arms out right now. He's saying, Cain, what have you done? Cain was no more or less guilty than we are every time we sin. Cain had sinned, and, and his sin happened to be he killed his brother. But he sinned nonetheless, and God reaches out to him and opens his arms and says, what have you done? What was his response? Well, look at him. No grief, no sorrow, no repentance, no contrition, no confession. He does not repudiate his errors. All we see is a sin-hardened heart, an evil heart of godlessness. You know, the first two questions in the Bible we've covered right here in our study. God says in chapter 3, where art thou, Adam? That's the first question in the Bible. It's God that's the seeker of sinners. The second question in the Bible is, where is Abel, your brother? These two questions, the first two in the Bible, are so significant. Sin will always find us out, even though we try like Cain to lie about our sin. Our sins cry out for God's vengeance. So what does Cain do? Well, it says, and so Cain, verse 16, went out from the presence of the Lord. One of the saddest verses in the Bible Cain had come to the altar of God's presence, to the altar of sacrifice, to the altar of substitution, to the altar where God says, you can approach me. And Cain came fully knowing what God wanted him to bring, and he chose to not bring that. He chose to come his own way. He chose to bring the wrong offering. God did not accept it, so he got so angry at his brother who was accepted that he killed him. And so God still pursues him with his arms open wide. And Cain chooses, like everyone who will ever go to hell, to turn his back on the only hope he had. And he goes out. He, like every sinner who has turned their face away from God, Cain went out into the darkness of wandering restlessly in sin. And you say, why did you call him restless Cain? Well, take a moment to look at a couple of verses with me. Go to the middle of your Bible, the book of Job. It's just for the Psalms. If you can find Psalms, back up one book to Job, chapter 20, verse 20. This is the original 2020, okay? And uh, the original 2020 was an expose of the heart of man. And God says in Job 2020, because he knows no quietness in his heart. Did you know you can be a living billboard for the Lord if you just... Live out the quietness and confidence he gives to those who are born again. Peace I give unto you, Jesus said. Not as the world gives unto you. It's not temporary out of a bottle or from a high. It is endless peace that God gives us. I always remember I was eating dinner with my wife in a, in a real pretty restaurant in um, Neuenschwanstein in Germany uh, in 1986. And we were sitting there, in fact, 
It's one of the only times we we were alone. Stell wasn't born yet, and Johnny was with Grandma, and so we sat there and uh, were eating for two hours. And at the end of two hours, someone walked up to our table and they went, <clears throat> and we looked up. And there was a lady who had on more rubies and emeralds and diamonds. I didn't think there were that many in the world. She just looked like a walking jewelry stand. She was wearing a white, white, some whatever white fur is, all the way to the floor. And just everything glistened, and she walked up, and she stood in front of our table, and she said, I have watched you for two hours. And then she looked at Bonnie right in her eyes. She said, why are you so tranquil? And then she introduced herself. Her name was Manisa Rijasha Pallavi. That's the Shah of Iran's daughter. That's where all the stuff came from. Her husband, Hans Guggenbuehl, is the minister of the Common Market Bank. And they sat at our table for an hour he was a Lutheran minister's son. She was a Persian royalty daughter. And they had everything in the world except God. And the one thing they wanted was tranquility. What does it say in Job 20:20? 20, 20? Because he knows no quietness his heart, he will not save anything he desires. When that lady walked away from our table, she clinked. I mean, every, all those things clinked together. She had, all of her wealth was wearing a lot of it. But she didn't have quietness in her heart, so she wouldn't have anything forever. Another great verse is Isaiah 57. Go to the right, because this is God's description of what those apart from Christ are. Isaiah 57, the last two verses, I hope you have them marked, because they're so critical to remember. Isaiah 57, 20 says, But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. Uh, everything they do, just it just brings up. That's why they have to have escapes, and they have to... Have, have something to, to make them forget because the longer they live, more muck and mire come up because their sins are never taken away. They're never forgotten. They're, they're constantly before them. And God says, verse 21, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Restless Cain, because he was a wicked Cain, because he rejected the only offering that would take away his sin. Well, real quickly, back to... Uh, Chapter 4 of Genesis, because I want to finish this. And I want to ask you something. Uh, look, look again at Genesis 4 and verse 16. It says, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. How come God didn't incinerate him? Why didn't he throw him in hell on the spot? Why didn't he chain him up in everlasting chains and darkness? Why didn't he start suffering the vengeance of eternal fire right on the spot? Why did he give him another moment to live? I think that's just the picture of God's grace. Cain became a walking sermon on the grace of God and also on the tragic consequences of sin. What a picture of humankind today. Cain walked out from the Lord restless, hopeless, wandering, defeated, and headed to destruction. And that's what everybody is apart from Christ this morning. There are two paths that led away that day from the altar outside of Eden. That blackened altar that was charred by a countless fires, stained with blood, that was ever illumined by the glow of the cherubim hovering around, those two lines that lead out from that altar can be followed throughout the Old Testament. The builders of the Tower of Babel followed the unbelieving and rebellious way of Cain, but Noah and his family followed the believing and obedient way of Abel. The vast majority of the ancient world followed the ungodly way of Cain, but God found Abraham and his household, and he called them, and they responded and followed the godly way of Abel. Those who follow the narrow way of faith will always be the minority. But for that faithful raiment, those who wear the righteousness of Christ, those who take the blood-stained offering of Christ in their place, for them God's blessings will never cease. The first path leads to heaven, the second path that Cain chose leads to hell. I think for us, the most horrible thing about hell is that it's eternal. If you took, uh, if there was a ship you could go on at the speed of light and we could go a hundred years out from our planet and get to the edge of our galaxy, and then we had endless power and we could take a hundred million billion years to go and fly at the speed of light to every galaxy in the most remote part of the universe. After we did all that, we would not even be through the first day of an endless eternity. Hell is so horrible because it's the dread of eternal separation and punishment 
that is inconceivably painful. This is the excruciating doctrine that Jonathan Edwards preached about here in America a few hundred years ago when he preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. And his metaphor was that our lives are hung by a mere thread and eternity gapes before us today. And we're over the blackness of the fires of hell. And when that cord is broken, we fall, endlessly falling, never coming to the bottom of that pit of fire. And yet with that knowledge, people choose to not flee to the everlasting arms of Jesus Christ underneath them. Well, I want to close by reading this. R.C. Sproul once said when he was preaching on this part of Genesis, In our inability to perceive the face of God, we all bear the mark of Cain on our foreheads. We all are vagabonds, fugitives, and pilgrims. We all have been consigned to live east of Eden. We all are exiles from paradise. We're expatriates from our native land. We all long to go home. We all want to kiss the earth of Eden. We all want to behold our Creator face to face as He walks in the cool of the garden. But though the veil of the temple has been torn and though Christ has accessed the presence of God for us, that angel with a flaming sword still guards the entrance to Eden. The sword will not be removed until we get to heaven, because the angel's sword protects paradise from humans with impure hearts. Even the slightest impurity bars us from heaven. Either all of your sins are on Christ, or none of your sins are on Christ. He doesn't pay for part of it, and you pay for the rest. He doesn't pay for part of it, and you suffer for the rest. He doesn't pay for part of it, and somebody else pays for the rest. Either he paid for it all, or he paid for none. The blessing, though we are banned by our sins from heaven, the open arms of Christ are extended to us. The dreadfulness of hell is met by the wonderful arms of Jesus, which he extends to us. Those arms that were stretched wide on the cross so that he might embrace us, because he was not only our atoning sacrifice, but the propitiation for our sins, turning aside his Father's righteous wrath. And Jesus today still has those same human, atoning, propitiating arms. And all we have to do is fall into them. Through faith in Christ, we can fall into the arms and thus into the hands of our living God.